The auditor asked me not to read his bio, then I looked out and I thought there's a lot of friendly faces, so many of you know him. So I just want to add some personal things and all that. A very kind gentleman, a loving family and um, father and husband. Uh, I learned a lot about how his faith has shaped his service. I kind of model that as well, family first and, um, and service in the community. So we, I know we have that in common. Um, I don't think I'll ever run for an elected office and so we'll never have that in common. But I appreciate um, He's actually, many of you know, he spent some time as a GAL here um, in our court. Um, really loved down on the um, third floor and um, domestic relations. So I thought it would be great if he spoke before, before. He's actually spoken at our, our uh, um, director's retreat. And we loved that. It was um, it's kind of sometimes hard to come home yeah. to uh, speak, but we felt like you were part of the family, so we appreciate that. So many of you know him. I'll leave that there. I'm sure he's going to have some things to say about his background. So can you help me welcome uh, Franklin County Auditor, Clarence Mingo. All right, so I was born in a manger. No, kidding. <laughs> Someone's like, is that in the book of Matthew? No, no, it's a joke. Uh, I'm Clarence Mingo, Auditor of Franklin County, and uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to uh, be with you. Uh, I've been busy uh, the last uh, year and a half. I've been circumnavigating the state, um, thinking about uh, a different form of public service. I've had a plan to run for uh, state treasurer and ended that campaign yesterday, and I I've spent the last... Uh, 18 months talking to uh, Ohioans in government, Ohio voters, Ohio taxpayers, Ohioans of, of every shade, and uh, I've been giving these uh, highfalutin speeches about economy and Medicaid and, and all these other things, and so uh, I will tell you today uh, is a reprieve and um, also a high dose of refreshment uh, to, uh, to be back home talking about um, the fundamentals of government, and uh, the fundamentals of government uh, foundationally starts with good leadership. Leadership. And so today, I hope to, to give you just a very brief presentation about uh, what good leadership looks like, most particularly where government is concerned. Um, I want to talk a little bit about things that we should consider uh, as leaders. Uh, some of you here are in roles that involve supervision or executive decisions. Um, others of you live under the burden of someone else's supervision or executive decision. Um, irrespective of where you sit or what your place is, I think you will find uh, today's presentation helpful and instructive, be it for yourself as a leader or perhaps a good measure of advice for those uh, who lead you. I'll have five points for your consideration. I'm typically not one to use video and, and material um, of this nature, uh, giving presentations or speeches. I like to just talk to people plainly, but um, I have this bad habit of watching television, and then when a commercial comes on, I can't help but think about how to formulate a speech around that commercial. <laughs> And, uh, it's, you know, it's one of those things I'm embarrassed to admit, but it's true. I'll see these commercials, and I'm like, ooh, speech. I, I want to talk about, you know, health care and Snickers, right? It's like, yeah. Um, but that is who I am. Uh, and in a moment of transparency, I'm not, not ashamed to admit it. All right. Um, let me make this first point. Um, after this video rolls, we'll get into it. Um, Mr. Schultz. All right, uh, that leads right into our first point, uh, which is simply this. Listen, those of us in leadership in this county, those of us in leadership in this county, we, we have a responsibility to consider what the daily life experience is like for those under our charge. Every single person in leadership in this county should be giving thought to what the person sitting next to them experiences on a daily basis. And it's an amazing thing for those of us who do have the capacity to change lives by way of our decisions. It's amazing how infrequently we consider what someone's experience is. It's true for so many of us. We show up to this building every day, 373 South High, and we're burdened. Uh, we are deeply discouraged and sometimes depressed or often frustrated about some experience that we've been encountering on the job month after month, week after week, day after day, and those in leadership never consider it. 
So if you're in leadership in Franklin County, doesn't matter what your title or what your role is, you should be walking into this building every single morning saying this to yourself. What is the daily experience of those who I lead? How can I impact it? What am I doing to endeavor to understand what that experience is like? Listen, if you have an office, you've got a nice chair, you just got the new furniture, your computer is state of the art, they gave you an iPhone and uh, access to just about everything Wi-Fi can offer in this county, you also have a parking spot so you never circumnavigate this building to find parking, you have a flexible schedule. You can come in at 9.30, but you mandate everyone else come in at 7.30. Life is pretty good for you. No one should take that away, and no one should begrudge the privilege that you have. But note this, you have a responsibility to understand what the experience of others might be. For that individual who can't quickly find parking and has to pay for it, making $14 an hour, compared to your $27 an hour, you've got to think about what that's like. For that individual that has very little vacation time because they've only been in the county for a year and a half and you've been here for 22 you got to experience or give thought to what the challenge might be for that individual trying to manage illness personal matters and family life that plush office that's warm heated that's warmly heated as opposed to that individual who sits in the cubicle you've been in the county for one year you got a highfalutin title this person's been there for 15 years in the same cubicle same carpet and in many cases the same furniture you got to give thought, very careful thought, to what that experience is, is like and how it diminishes their ability to perform their daily duties and responsibilities. This is the charge of every Franklin County leader. We have to walk in this building and give first thought. Our number one consideration must be to the plight, to the experience, and to the welfare of those whom we lead. I'm a veteran of the first Persian Gulf War. I served in the Army's 1st Infantry Division out of Fort Riley, Kansas. And um, I enlisted in the Army on uh, June, strike that, July 10th, 1990, August 2nd, 1990. Uh, Iraq invaded a small and then unknown country called Kuwait. December 26th of 1990, I'm on an airplane bound for Saudi Arabia to participate in what was then Operation Desert Shield, ultimately became Operation Desert Storm. I was with the 1st Infantry Division. This is a heavy mechanized uh, military division. It's swift, it's, it's fast, it's powerful. Great destructive capabilities. And um, I was with a field artillery unit. And we were living in a good degree of, of misery. We went to the desert understanding that it never rained. It rained the first four weeks of our stint. Uh, <laughs> in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the ground offensive came, we swept into Iraq. Um, the weather was bad, the conditions were poor, and it was not a very hospitable place. Even for soldiers, uh, life in the desert is just miserable. And um, we would have leaders, non-commissioned officers and, and officers alike, uh, who had tents, warmly heated tents, and uh, comforts that we didn't have. But I will tell you, there was one officer, his name was uh, Lieutenant Lieutenant Dave Szynski. This is a remarkable man. He saved my life. I won't tell you that story today, but I've not forgotten Lieutenant Szynski. Uh, he was one of the few officers who would come down from the tents and he would walk what we call the gun line. The gun line is where all the soldiers were in foxholes, untented, unsheltered. And he would come and visit us for one basic purpose, to understand what the minute-by-minute, moment-by-moment experience was for the average combat soldier under his charge doing that war. And that man's name and his face are forever imprinted on my mind for the three or four trips he made to the gun line to make sure that we were well situated and to ensure that he himself had an understanding of what it was we were enduring and experiencing on a daily basis. But we have the same charge. We have the same charge here in Franklin County. Those of us in leadership, you need to show up tomorrow understanding or at least endeavoring to understand what those next to you or those whom you lead are experiencing. And then you have to make those experiences right. You have to make those experiences right. Listen, we come here all too often as leaders and we give the orders, we mark the attendance, we make sure the payroll is done and we execute the business. But we also have the capacity to improve life for people under our watch. And improving life can be a marginal thing. That person that's been here for 15 years, you make a note of it. You make sure that person is in an office. 
that person who labors overtime and extra time and is willing to be here on weekends or, or will stay late when needed, you make sure that person gets a personal day, an administrative day, a bonus, right? This is Franklin County government. We're unfamiliar with the term bonus, as if government doesn't have the capacity to issue a $2,500 check to that employee that's gone above the call of duty on behalf of taxpayers. You should be talking to those senior to you and making sure they understand what's happening with those you lead, and then you make sure they are rewarded. You make sure those folks are rewarded, and you make sure they are well situated. Now, I told you I'm an Army veteran of the first Persian Gulf War. My brother was in the Marines. His name is Lance. He works at the Board of Elections. And um, he was in the Gulf War II. We were both deployed. He was with the 2nd Marine Division. I was with the 1st Infantry Division. We were in southern Iraq. He was up around Kuwait. And uh, he would occasionally write me these letters, and he would always say, Army stands for ain't ready to be a Marine yet. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Maybe there's some truth to that. Uh, but the Marines didn't have Lieutenant Dave Szynski. They didn't have Lieutenant Dave Szynski. This man simply cared about the welfare of the soldiers under his charge. We must have a similar watch, the same level of vigilance, not for ourselves, but on behalf of those we lead. Sometimes people hate going to work. We got to make it better or at least understand it. All right, Kevin, cue the next video. Uh, you know, I shouldn't say this because this is being recorded, but I can't help but chuckle at the line. You're playing like Betty White. That's not what your girlfriend <laughs> I got, you know, an 11 and 12 year old and that, you know, I got to try to explain it. You know, they ask, what does that mean, Dad? It's like, yeah, well, let's not do that. I like Betty White. Remember Golden Girls by Show of Hands? I love that show. Uh, my second point is simply this. You need to consider how people perceive you. If you're a leader in this county, you need to consider how people perceive you. Listen, you walk in one way thinking that you have the title, you have the job, you've been in this position for a long time, you can, with a stroke of a pen, move life this way or that way for someone who works in county government. You're giving instructions, you're executing the business on a daily basis, and it all seems good from your perspective. But you need to give very good thought to how it is you are perceived. How are those whom you lead perceiving you? Do they perceive you as a tyrant? Do they perceive you as thoughtful? Do they perceive you as a listener? Do they think you have even a scintilla of compassion or concern about what their life is like outside of the confines of this building? How are people perceiving you? We must ask ourselves that question on a regular basis because that is the best measurement of your ability to lead and command the respect of those around you. If they understand that you have the ability to self-reflect, that you will challenge yourself, and that you are willing to admit that on some days you are not what you should be on their behalf, they will come to respect that. They will come to value and appreciate your willingness to examine yourself for their good to make sure that the perception you think you have of yourself rightly reflects the reality that they are seeing and experiencing on a daily basis. I became auditor eight years ago. It feels like 16. I'll tell you, this last reappraisal and the values kind of been tough. And um, I came here with an idea of uh, what I looked like as a leader. I thought I, I had a very good understanding of what the leadership looks like and how it should be displayed. And um, I thought I had a high definition view who I was and how others perceived me, I quickly learned from close friends around me that that vision was a little skewed. Uh, my judgment was not as sound as I thought. My interactions were not as constructive as I had believed. And the wisdom I thought that I was perpetrating upon the masses, not as good as I thought. And most of this came from an individual or individuals who had the courage and concern and care for me to say, look, auditor, you're not bad, but let me tell you where you need to polish a little bit. Your voice needs to be stronger. Your command presence needs to improve. The consideration for the history of this county and why the policies are, you need to bone up and strengthen yourself in that particular uh, base of knowledge. Auditor, there's a whole section of the office you know nothing about. You need to find your way there and learn about it. 
There's this place called the Franklin County Data Center, and they do technology. And technology is more than the phone in your hand. You need to become well adept and versed in the concept of technology because it involves your charge, your statutory duties, and the daily responsibilities that you are responsible for carrying out. Auditor people don't see you enough. Sometimes people never see you. What are you doing about that? You gotta, you gotta have presence. I understand you're, you're doing, but, but, but you have to have some presence, auditor. These are, these are things I, I've faced on, on, a, on a daily basis. There are issues and challenges and, and um, people that I have needed to engage that I have neglected or otherwise overlooked. All because I lacked the ability to self-reflect because I was convinced that the presentation that I thought I was giving was masterful and right and good in the sight of all. And so I thank God for those who are willing to come alongside of me and say, listen, auditor, you got to make some changes. And let me tell you where that list, not that one thing, where that list begins. Now, this is hard for a leader. This is very hard because when you're in leadership and you have duties and responsibility and then you have power to exercise that duty and responsibility, it can be deeply humbling to have someone come along and tell you you're not right or you should be doing it better or you should be doing this way. And it's made hard because that someone is likely someone whose title, whose pay, whose parking spot is not akin to yours. That's likely someone junior to you. You need to identify that individual in your life. You need to identify that individual in your life and give them the freedom to challenge you, to correct you, and to polish you in ways that you are unlikely to do for yourself. And so we must be very careful and thoughtful about the perception we have of ourselves, being very careful to ensure that that perception matches the reality that others have when viewing us. Now let me close on this point by saying this, we're not all going to agree. I, I can tell you I, I'm mindful of this. My daughters find it hard to believe that people in this county don't always agree with me. And uh, this is just three nights ago. I said, Annalise, I pulled up the uh, election results uh, from 2010. I said, Annalise, 48% of these people did not vote for me. I mean, these are, you know, these are these are people who, you know, who for whatever reason didn't think your dad was. Then I showed her some Facebook postings after the values were released, right? <laughs> well, listen, let me tell you this. When your name is in the newspaper uh, and when you go on Facebook or Twitter and, and there are people sounding off about you, uh, you can either become bitter or you can be deeply humble about it. And uh, the bitterness won't take you far. The hum humility will at least lead you on the path where you're willing to accept and understand you are not everything you think you are in the sight of others. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, but you have to start with that reality. You are not everything you think you are in the sight of others. And the sooner you endeavor to understand the perception of other people with respect to yourself, and then you begin to weigh whether or not those perceptions are accurate, and then you make corrections where corrections need to be made, and you strengthen yourself where you're already strong. Until you're willing to do that analysis, your ability to be effective as a leader is only going to be marginal. Challenge yourself, understand the perceptions people have of you, and make corrections where appropriate and we're right. Mr. Schultz, cue the next video. That's from 2011. I've waited six years to give this speech for this video. I mean, um, so what's our message here? Young Jedi's, right? What's, what's our message here, young Jedi's? It's simply this. I want you to make note of this. Listen to me carefully. You're not as powerful as you think. Listen to me. You're, you're not as powerful as you think. I know you started out in an entry-level position here, and we've watched you grow and develop uh, into leadership, and maybe you've labored hard, and maybe you earned that new title or that promotion you got. But understand this, your power is derived from someone else or something else. You are not individually and exclusively, monolithically, empowered or capable in and of yourself. Your power comes from someone else. Someone looked upon you and said, hey, you're deserving of leadership. We want to equip you with the tools and responsibilities to begin leading. You have to understand that, that your power, the, the duties you have as a leader, the responsibility, the charge that you have been given, the privilege that you have that comes along with leadership, it likely started in the hands of someone else who looked at you, pushed a button and said, you, you're the one, you will lead. And you owe it to that person, whoever they are, to ensure that they are proud of what you're doing. 
I think about this all the time. Uh, I lost my dad. I've been talking about this all year. I lost my dad some time ago. Actually, it wasn't some time ago. It was in June of this year, 2017. I wish you could have met Clarence Mingo. Um, this, this man, uh, and I'm not being romantic or philosophical about it, but he was marvelous, just marvelous in his character and his nature, chiefly because it was marked by humility. My dad spent life on his earth. I'm not ashamed to say this. He died with about $37 in his pocket, stage for lung cancer, had it for four years, never complained about anything. No matter what his condition was, he never complained, never thought twice about the hardship or the challenges he had in life. Never complained about how he was treated unfairly or, or was deprived of this or that. He just endured every circumstance with humility, great degree of thankfulness, always willing to move forward. Grateful for the little things in, in life. And um, I think back to uh, the first week in June. He was suffering from delirium at this time. He's staged for lung cancer. And um, he um, this delirium, it's, it's, it's really a unique condition. It's not dementia, but it's akin to it. He literally overnight lost um, the personality and the character that he had. It was really remarkable, and it was frightening. And the thing about delirium is that uh, very few families talk about it. It's something you manage in the dark, in the shadows, in privacy, because you can't explain to someone else this crisis that you're living at home with someone who was once beloved, esteemed, and whose personality has suddenly become erratic or violent or simply different. And so it was a very dark time for my family, but just before that delirium literally took over his mind, um, I remember asking him what his chief motivation was in life. I said, Dad, I want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding this because I want uh, your other children and certainly the grandchildren to understand what, what was your chief motivation in life. And um, I'll tell you the secret. I'm going to answer my father's question, but I'll tell you the secret. Uh, I'm Clarence Mingo for you know uh, political purposes and public life, but uh, if you're from Canton, Ohio, where I grew up, if you went to Canton McKinley, um, if you're a part of my family and it's fairly large, no one calls me Clarence. Everyone calls me Flu. F L U. It's the, if you're from Canton, Ohio, everyone has a name. Mine was Flu. It's what my, if you, my mother texts me. It's Flu. I need you to do just what it is. It's a strange thing, but it's true. Anyway, he says, Flu. Let me tell you. Um, you know, my, my, my chief motivation in life was um, doing my best to live in a way that would make you proud and that would honor God. That's it. My, my, my chief motivation in life was doing my best to make you proud and living in a way that, that, that would honor God. And I thought to myself, how, how remarkable is that? The responsibility this man had as a parent to me in his mind was predicated upon chiefly making sure he did right by his children in a way that would be esteemed before men and before God. And so he understood that the charge and responsibility he had was derived, the commitment was derived in others, and that commitment was derived in his children and in his wife of 51 years, always remembering that the choices he made his very actions and his daily conduct were all designed to ensure that we could look at him, despite his perfections, and say at the end of his life, well done, thank you. And so we have the same responsibility as leaders. Whoever it was that gave you that job, that gave you the promotion, you ought to be thinking about that person. And you should be asking yourself, if they were here right now, would they regret the decision they made to equip you with the title, the rank, and the ability and power and position you have? Would there be regrets? You should ask yourselves the day you were appointed and those who congratulated you on the promotion and, and, and wished you well on, on the new endeavor or the new responsibilities, would they live with a good degree of regret at what you've become? Because your arrogance and your lack of concern and the lack of understanding and the fact that you lack consideration for anything other than what is personally best for you, but that weigh heavily on their mind? Or what they say, you know what, I'm, I'm darn proud of that person. Darn proud of them. Not perfect by any stretch of the magic. Not, absolutely not perfect, but overall, well done. I can see them growing, and I, and I love seeing it. we got to remember, there was someone who came before you, someone who at least looked upon you and thought you deserved the opportunity. At a minimum, you ought to be laboring to make them proud. Laboring in appreciation for the opportunity you were given. Always remembering that you're not as powerful as you think. 
and that the influence of rank and power you had came from another, and at a minimum you ought to be laboring with that person in mind, trying to honor the responsibility and privilege they gave you to serve as a leader. Mr. Schultz, next video. All right, I'm with State Auto, but it's all right. It's okay. All right, listen, as leaders, as leaders, we have to understand that people hear us differently. As leaders, people hear us differently. If you're a leader here in Franklin County and you are giving instructions and commands and directions about how things should be done, or you're enforcing a policy, and you know why you're enforcing that policy, you should understand you might be right in the enforcement, but that doesn't mean others perceive and understand why you are taking that action. This commercial demonstrates that marvelously. This is a gentleman who is rightly conducting business on behalf of his family, securing that um, insurance completely misperceived by his spouse. She heard something absolutely opposite, different than what he was actually doing. And this is often true of those of us in leadership. We know exactly why we are adhering to a certain policy. We know exactly why we mandate that the workday be from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And why? You can't skirt even a minute because you understand the state auditor can investigate that and that matter could turn into something. You understand why there is great scrutiny spent on how we are conducting our business and whether or not we are staying within the prescribed boundaries for the conduct that, of that business. And you enforce that and you mandate that and you make sure those above you on a daily basis are burdened with the guidance, the care, and the concern of making sure that business is carried out in a certain way. You understand why you do that. You may understand the law. You might understand the revised code. You might understand the history in such a way that those around you do not. And so when we're giving instruction, we must be very careful as leaders not to command and demand, but to advise, to counsel, and to encourage as to why we are leading in a certain capacity, as to why certain decisions are made, laying out the very history the very motivation for the reasons why we do business the way we do it. Listen, my girls all the time will say, Dad, I don't want to do this. And I'll say, well, you should. And they'll say, well, Grandma said, right? How many of you have heard that? Right, Grandma? And um, I noted this with my mother. This is just years of experience. Uh, she's an educator, not literally, but figuratively. I mean, she's very careful to give my girls the reason, the motivation, the history, perspective about why they should do this versus that, or why they have to do it this way and not that way. I'm not like that. I'm like, look, right? Just not, right? I was uh, thinking about um, my girls this summer, and uh, Angela and I, my wife, we've been trying to educate them about this concept called payday, right? Uh, when we grew up, it was this thing called payday. It, just, it simply meant that on payday, you got things, right? Maybe it was a trip to McDonald's. Maybe it was Toys R Us. It was something, but payday meant something. And you understand, you didn't ask for anything until payday. You just didn't. So I'm trying to indoctrinate my girls into this, <laughs> this word. And so I've been, I told them all summer, I was like, girls, listen, it's not payday. It's not payday. You don't get anything. You don't get food. You don't get water. You don't get toy. You don't get anything until payday, right? But I'm doing this because I want them to understand that the resources we have, right, uh, this comes from somewhere. And so I have learned that I need to give them the instruction, the history, the motivation, the rationale for why it is things are the way they are. Can't do anything on Monday, got to wait till Friday. Why? That's payday. Now it makes sense. So on uh, Friday, I get the text message at 7 a.m. Boom! Here it is. Dad, 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 dad. So... We as leaders have got to not only command and demand, but we have to be very careful to instruct, making sure that those whom we lead understand why we're doing what we're doing. Because when they understand it, they might appreciate it. And when they appreciate it, they will execute it with a higher degree of competency. And therein we all benefit when that business or that matter is handled in a way in which we all understand, well executed, great competency, great outcome, success in county government not only command and demand, but also instruct and advise as to why we're doing what we need to do. Mr. Schultz, the fifth and final video. Hilarious indeed. 
fifth and final point is simply this. Uh, this is a two-way street, and I'll give two perspectives here. The first is this. If you're a leader here in Franklin County, uh, let's be transparent and drop the pretense and start right here. You don't have it all together. You, you don't. You, you show up in your tie in that well-tailored suit, and you got the parking spot in the county garage, and uh, you actually go out to lunch, kind of come back when you're ready, and it all looks good. looks really good. But the truth is, your life is exactly like mine. If you're married, you've got some challenges. Been married 25 years and know about marital challenges. Your kids, they're great. They got great names and good in school and the pictures are up. But you know the reality about those kids. You know the reality. They're real challenges. Financially, you make $85,000. It sounds really good, but the truth is you're struggling financially, check to check, because the mortgage you got in 2008 was a little more than perhaps you should have taken out. Or maybe a spouse lost their job and financially your situation has changed and you're living with a financial burden trying to make it day to day and yet you've got to come here and lead all the while carrying the real burdens of life. Maybe it's a health situation like I went through, running statewide, appearing before hundreds, giving speeches, shaking hands, um, representing the people of the state at least from my perspective, all the while coming back home to see my father dying and having to do very personal and intimate things to make sure that he was well cared for. Maybe you're like me with Parkinson's disease and sometimes you can't tie your shoes in the morning, can't always button the shirt, struggle sometimes to brush my teeth with a normal toothbrush, can't wake up in the morning and get in the shower as easily as an average person would. I've got to wait till physically I can do it. With Parkinson's disease, sometimes I can't wear jeans because they're just too rigid, so I've got to wear these spandexy type pants, right? You wouldn't know that, but I do. It's part of my reality. I'm just telling you that you don't have to live with pretense as a leader because the reality is and the truth is you've got challenges in life and you don't have it all together and it's not as good as it looks. And I want to relieve you of that burden by simply telling you this, that's okay. That's okay. You're, you're like the rest of us. The challenges you have in life, whether they are self-inflicted or perhaps put upon you by someone else, how they got there matters not. We need as leaders to at least accept that reality about ourselves and not carry this terrible tyranny called pretense. That simply means you are pretending in some level, on some level to be something that you simply are not. And that something for most of us is some degree of perfect, which none of us are. I don't need to know what those personal problems are. It's none of my business what the state of your marriage is. It's not my business what your financial plight is. And it's not my business about the other sufferings or challenges you might have in life. You might have a general level of concern about it, but you need not share those things with me. But what you should know is that it's okay to have those challenges. And those challenges are not a reflection of your ability to lead. They are not a reflection of whether or not you deserve the opportunity and privilege of leadership you have not live with that stress, that tyranny called pretense, which means you are forced to pretend to be something that you simply in reality are not. Now the other half of that equation is that those you lead have challenges. They too have challenges. I've not been through a divorce, but I imagine it's a heavy burden to carry on a daily, on a daily basis. And when you're going through a divorce or some other significant life challenge, guess what? You still have to show up right here on the job in county government and make sure those tax bills are calculated or make sure those files are properly delivered or make sure that case is rightly adjudicated. Life doesn't stop because you're going through those real challenges. You got a medical situation that no one knows about. Maybe it's an internal situation. I have one of those. I've got this Parkinson's disease. It just doesn't only affect me physically, but it infects some internal organs like my bladder. Very personal and sensitive issues. I live with this and walk with it on a daily basis. And I will tell you, I'm grateful that there are at least two or three people around me who are concerned about that condition. They're concerned about it. They're willing to accommodate it. And it may not be shared or publicly known, but these people with great care, with great caution, and the highest degree of confidentiality make sure that some of the burdens I'm carrying on a personal basis, they are well managed. They are accommodated for the good so that I can continue serving. Listen to me, leaders here in Franklin County. You have the same responsibility. The very life challenges you experience, 
and that can be managed perhaps a little better because of the privileges you have in leadership, you ought to be mindful that those who sit beneath you don't have the same privileges. And the challenges of managing some of those stresses and life burdens may be a little different because of where they sit. You can make that right. You can be sensitive to the challenges of others. And because someone shows up here every day at work and because they execute the business of this county in a masterful way does not mean all is well in their life. And you have it within your power to do a little better for them to ensure that whatever their experience is here, is here in this county, does not complicate or otherwise make worse the other experiences or life challenges they may be going through. You must understand this about yourself. Free yourself of the tyranny called pretense, pretending to be something you are not because you are in leadership. And then you must turn around and look at those whom you lead and say to yourself, I know they have similar life challenges. How can I accommodate? How can I assist? How can I invoke the highest level of confidentiality, concern, care, and consideration and make sure whatever those life challenges are, they are made better based on the power and the ability that I have to influence these individuals for the good. Let me close out um, with just a, a quick story. Um, I'm going back to maybe April, April 2017. I was uh, uh, not on the campaign trail. Uh, I was actually at home. I was in my living room with my father. He was asleep, and I was watching the news. This is the day that the FBI director, James Comey, was in battle with President Trump over well, all manner of things. <laughs> And um, Director Comey was testifying before the Congress about the business of the president. And uh, my daughter, Annalise, was watching this with me. And I remember she said, Dad, who do you believe in this situation? Do you believe uh, the FBI director, Director Comey, or do you believe the president? And I said, well, I don't know. I'm not sure who I believe. We should watch this and listen and then determine what the truth is. And um, she said, well, Dad, why can't they just do a lie detector test, That this thing? Why can't they just hook the director up and the president up and see who's telling the truth. I said, well, the law doesn't permit this. The law doesn't allow this. The Constitution doesn't permit it. You just can't do it. And she said, well, Dad, you're a lawyer. Have you ever seen one of these things? I said, a polygraph machine? And Annalise said, yes, a polygraph machine. I said, seen one? I married one, right? I mean, <laughs> now, I, listen, you, you don't know Angela Mingo. Perhaps you'll have the, the, the privilege to meet her, but let me tell you, just a fantastic soul. I've been fortunate in life. i got two great parents, five great siblings, and my wife is just 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 to die for and um, but she's a profound seeker of truth she's a profound seeker of truth I will tell you I can't deceive her she'll ask me did you pack the lunches I'm like yeah you know it's like did you give them the lunch money it's like I gotta gotta kind of code it to say yes but the answer is really no but she knows she's just very adept at finding the truth and um, we as leaders must be the same way. Uh, this presentation in large part has been about humility and self-reflection, uh, but also truthfulness. Truthfulness about who we are, how we are leading, how that is perceived, how our power is exercised. Uh, Self-examining ourselves to determine whether or not we are leading in a way that is good, helpful, and uplifting to others, or is our only consideration for ourselves and not for the welfare and good of those around us or those who we lead. Are we truthful with who we are, how we are perceived, and what we look like? And when, then we, when we find that truth, are we handling it with humility? Right? With humility, that's the ability to accept certain things that are less than about yourself. And then with great honor and esteem, write those things so that the less than is now greater than. Truth, humility, candor, self-reflection, the watchwords of good leaders here in Franklin County. I'm Clarence Mingo. Grace and peace to you. Thank you very much.